experience for this academic year. And our first speaker for today is Chris Kushnoi, who is a, a very well known at Stanford, so my introduction will be very brief. He's a, a professor in electrical engineering and a courtesy in uh, bioengineering and neurobiology, and uh, investigators uh, in uh, Howard Hughes uh, Medical Institute. Uh, he's working on exploration of uh, uh, movement of uh, prosthetic limbs for, uh, to uh, paralyze uh, patients. And uh, uh, he's, uh, he has multiple awards, I'll read a few. Uh, so, Boris, welcome to Fun Career Award for Biomedical Sciences and Biomedical Sciences Sloan Fellowship and My Technological uh, Innovations in Neurosciences Award, the Managed Director's Pioneer uh, Award. And Krishna also serves uh, uh, as advisor on multiple awards, including the University of Washington Center for Sensor Motor Neuroengineering, Control Labs, MindX, Inspotics, Healing Corporation, and also consultant to Neurobi. So today, Krishna will tell us about the progress in brain-machine interfaces or applications to restoration of habits of developing applications to aesthetic things. At least it's not in the title, so we'll see. Thank you very much, Daniel. So first of all, I want to see if everybody can hear me OK. I'll try to speak uh, loudly enough, uh, and we'll just dive right in. So it's. Uh, Thrilled to be uh, back with the new academic school year, many new faces, many old friends, of course. And this seminar series, I think, has been doing a wonderful job of bringing us together, uh, forming a community in and around the broad areas of interest related to the nervous system, broadly defined, and the ways to interact. And I think uh, last year we heard a wide assortment of technologies and systems and, and, and so forth. And this sort of continues to along with that, OK? So what I'll do is try to uh, succinctly, so I'll move a little bit rapidly, happy to take questions along the way or at the end, describe uh, three things. First is why we think the time is right that we can start interfacing directly with the brain based on wonderful successes in the, the broad field of neural interfaces that come before. Second, how we've tried to, over the past uh, 18 years now, actually here at Stanford, uh, and before that as a postdoc, try to use uh, animal models, the preclinical model, to see if we can learn enough about the brain, control devices well enough that we then can meaningfully, at the correct time, take the leap to try uh, this in people. And this is part of the clinical trial. Uh, and I've been doing that together with Professor Jamie Henderson, who many of you know, who's in neurosurgery right here, who puts in our deep brain stimulator implants. Uh, and we've been working super closely every single day for the last nine years uh, on what we call the Neural Prosthetics Translational Lab that works with people with upper spinal cord injury Lou Gehrig's disease, you take from the lab, learn new lessons in people, back to the lab, and it's a whole sort of smorgasbord of engineering and science and clinical application that I think exemplifies the types of things that uh, set Stanford apart and enjoy to do that type of thing. Okay, so I've already covered the outline here, which is, I'll tell you a little bit about past DMI. We'll go through some preclinical Files, and then towards people, and I'll leave off with three future directions that are a little bit more technologically focused. Uh, but it's more uh, saying what the needs are than they are prescribing uh, exact solutions or things that we uh, ourselves don't necessarily work on all that much. Okay, so many of you are familiar that over the past 15, 20 years, We've seen this rapid explosion of implantables, hands, knees, legs, of course, pacemakers, cochlear implants, to the point that it's utterly almost keen to imagine, if you think about it, after you get over the initial shock, you go, oh yeah, I guess I know somebody with an artificial knee, and on around here. And what's emerging is this next frontier of really doing four 
something inside the brain. And the question really boils down to, is there something sadistic about the brain? Or is it just that we know, sadly, little about this organ? And I think it's the latter. Uh, if we can understand how the brain works, how its electrical and chemical signals operate, manipulate, compute, store, retrieve, enact, uh, all these different types of signals, then we can have meaningful conversations with it, okay? And skirt around areas that are damaged, pull signals out, write signals in, and so forth, okay? Now, that whole broad area I just described is, of course, neuroscience, which is going through its own revolution for its own pure basic science sake, right? And here, we're just talking about how we could uh, leverage that or add to that and then use that to help people with disabilities and uh, limitations. So let's first of all consider a few systems that write in information, then we'll flip the arrow around and talk about feed outs. Okay, just as a way of organizing this. So we're familiar with retinal implants, of course, the wonderful work of uh, Daniel and EJ sitting at the back of the room. We're very familiar here at Stanford about the problems with the loss of vision and the set of ideas of how to help restore that vision in very, very important ways. And that, of course, also ranges from beautiful basic science research, basic engineering, all the way to meaningful clinical applications and back and forth. And probably many of you are in their research groups, so uh, there, there's your eyeball icon, okay? <laughs> Read it as a much larger field than this little picture that exemplified. Cochlear implant. There is work, of course, going on at Stanford over laryngology on cochlear implants. This is perhaps the granddaddy of them all. It slips a wire, multiple contacts down the cochlea and electrically stimulates different points along the cochlea, thereby activating different frequency channels. And surprisingly, with relatively few, on the order of 10 distinct uh, frequencies that are stimulated, People that are actually born even congenitally deaf can learn to understand spoken language, okay? And it's really profound. Now, you can't maybe hear and appreciate high-end music. There's still a lot of room to grow, but it's a tremendous uh, state of practice that is offered to people every day in this country and around the world. And, and this really can't well the brain machine interface, even though it's the peripheral nerves that are being contacted. Now, the brain stimulator really takes us directly into a deep part of the brain called the Sancha nigra, the basal ganglia. And for those of you that don't know, uh, Parkinsonian tremor can sometimes be treated for at least a brief period of time with a dopamine neurotransmitter precursor called the L-dopa, but eventually that doesn't work any longer. And so what, uh, actually, Jamie Henderson, our colleague right here, does, uh, actually every Friday, is put about a four-inch long electrode into an area targeting it to within the cubic millimeter. And a wire is run down to a chest-like cardiac pacemaker unit, and it trickles electrical current in, disrupting the neural activity, disrupting that aberrant activity, and that tremor stops, literally in the OR with Turn the stimulator on, the tremor stops. And you say, well, that's good. Yeah. You leave it on all the time? Yeah. So companies like Medtronic are really good at this. You can have these systems battery operated for eight, 10 years, and you just trickle current in there. You get adjustments to increase the frequency or decrease it or amplitude and so forth. And you can manage your tremor that way. You can put them in bilaterally also. Okay? So those are examples of systems that write in information, and the most recent of all is the epilepsy implant, Neuropace, which is just down the road in Mountain View, basically implants this device that has electrodes over a region that is believed to be sensitive to detecting the onset of an epileptic, an epileptic tremor. It then does real-time signal processing to determine if that's going to happen. Uh, you don't want a false positive. But if it really is going to happen, then you can go ahead and stimulate electrical current out of other electrodes or the same electrodes, okay? And that can disrupt that epileptic seizure from happening at all or as bad, okay? So these types of internal systems that are now 
as I've just described, reading information from the brain, processing it, and writing it out, are really a picture of the future. Now, reading information out, you can imagine that these same brain stimulators that trickle current in have more recently added extra capacity so that they can also record signals coming out. Okay, so Medtronic completed a line of these systems, and that's allowing for the basic neuroscientific understanding of these areas that are implanted a little bit more uh, deeply and so forth. And these epilepsy implants, uh, like Neuropace RNS, we've already talked about, where here you can see both the stimulating and the recording side. Okay, so that is real, right? That is, you know, I don't know how big the market is, but it's more than a dollar and less than a trillion dollars, right? <laughs> I'll always guess tens of billions, that's the right number in medicine, okay? So it's a big market, uh, but it's barely scratching the surface, the, the surface of the huge problem of neurological disease and disorder. There's so little we can do for uh, psychiatric uh, conditions or paralysis or mood disorder or appetite disorder and on and on and on. And if we can somehow understand the brain circuit and then actively work with them in a specific enough way, this could really be the entire future of medical device electronic uh, intervention with the nervous system. So let's imagine that where we want to go. Okay? So let's imagine that it's not possible to record for thousands or even millions of neurons, okay? Not surprising numbers anymore, right? When those of us that were talking about these things 10 years ago, like crazy talk, but now, of course, you know, there's actually literally teams out there working on DARPA programs right now going after multiple millions of recordings and millions of stimulation points. Stimulating the same uh, order of magnitude, with fully implantable ultra low power systems, right? So a lot of colleagues, of course, Merman, Ada Poon, right here, working on these types of things together with people like Nick Nelock to think about recording and stimulating. And of course, neuroscientifically understanding what it is to measure and stimulate, okay? Now, as uh, an engineer, neuroscientist, I would without say, there's your heart as well, okay? I have not in any way, shape, or form, minimizing these three. These three are brutal. But fundamentally, until we know what to do, we can't even use our technology to do it, okay? So it has to be hand in hand. So let's zoom in now to the problem you selected to work on for the last 20 years, okay? That fits in this overall picture that I described. And that is paralysis, where there's around 5 million people in the U.S. that are paralyzed for a variety of causes most importantly are stroke and spinal cord injury. And this picture of Christopher Reed is a reminder to us that uh, it's uh, it mud. In his case, in the midnight, he broke from a horse, broke his spinal cord, and from that day until he unfortunately passed about 10 years ago, he's not able to move his arms, his leg, or less appreciated because he had to be ventilated, he was not able to speak clearly or communicate clearly. And despite being a person of considerable means, started a foundation for advocacy, for funding research, for our research, many people's on campus research, uh, unfortunately, this all has to move dramatically down the field, okay? Uh, what I'll be showing you is perhaps one of the leading candidates for how we're trying to move that needle, but it's not uh, where we all hoped it would have been 10 years ago, of course. So how does this work? Well, let's imagine we want to reach out with our arm to pick up this cup, we can localize, locate the cup with the visual areas of our brain. Those signals are sent anterior to the frontal lobe where the motor cortex resides, both so-called premotor and motor cortex. And what we can do is we can put in electrode arrays, I'll say more about this in a few minutes, to pull out the neural activity, schematized here are showing little action potentials, the little electrical blips that, uh, that one neuron needs to communicate with another, and not just three neurons, but from how many neurons you can extract, okay? Many hundreds at the same time routine these days, not thousands, but hundreds. Those signals are then decoded using mathematical algorithms run on low power electronics, okay? And then you can do one of two things. One is you can actually functionally electrically simulate 
the paralyzed arm. That's shown here. So this is a person that one of our collaborators in Cleveland, this is Case Western Preserves, works, has done to take out the neural intention smoothing arm, transfer the signal to the simulation pattern of permanently implanted electrodes in and around the muscle bodies. And basically, you're telling each muscle when to fire, how hard to fire, and you're effectively reanimating the arm. Okay? It's a very interesting inverse kinematic dynamics model that you, know, you have to solve. Uh, it turns out to be surprisingly hard to overcome gravity. You have to drive muscles so hard to fatigue it. But this is a very promising avenue of research. Another, it showed us this path here, is to actually drive a prosthetic, a prosthetic arm. Our colleagues at Brown and Harvard that were actually working as part of a multi-site trial, as well as other colleagues at Pittsburgh, these are Jim Collins, Andy Schwartz, folks like this, have had tremendous success in the past five to uh, ten years in taking out hands and using them to drive otherwise off the shelf robotic arm and move that to not just one, two, or three dimensions, but also four or five dimensions and you know, keep working your way up to those dimensions. And this is very useful for people who are amputated, okay, or otherwise paralyzed in the system harm. Okay? Now, tremendous real world challenges exist, of course. How do you mount that arm, how to bust that arm, how to power the arm, and so forth. But we're right now in the business of proof of concepts, right? Is this even possible? Because if it's even possible, then of course there needs to be you know, industry gets involved, really scale to pick up and tax part of the problem. Okay? And I think we're really at that precipice, we're at that cusp where those things are starting to happen. Companies are starting to form, companies are starting to be acquired, that type of thing. I will be focusing on either of these two. Okay? Our work is intimately related to the two. We can certainly bring out the results to drive the two, but we simply move computer cursors on a screen. We do it for two reasons, right? One is uh, we're lazy. It's much easier to drive a computer cursor than a robotic arm to simulate the arm. Okay? Uh, I think we can do interesting things with that, but let's just call it. Okay? Now, the real reason to do this is because we are living in 2019. We're not living in 1998 or 1999 or even 2009. What people want is independence. All the surveys show people want independence. What that increasingly means is not that I can pick up my own cough, uh, dot, dot, dot. It means that I can meaningfully interact with a computer or a tablet or my phone. Because once I can get effectively a bit stream out of a computer, it can do the most. Right? I mean, if I can talk to an Alexa, I can do a whole lot. If I can talk to uh, any other type of technology, I can do a lot. So ways of interacting rapidly with computer systems to type or computer cursors and everything is in and of itself a desired useful thing. Okay? And that's what we've been focused on. All right. Now, I will speed up a little bit here now that we're hopefully we feeling that we're on the same page. And, okay. All right. It's also like day two of the quarter, so <laughs> we'll ease our way. How are we going to measure these neural signals? One way is from outside of the head by putting on scalp-based electrical sensors called EEG sensors. This is super important and used all the time in neurology. It's a great way to screen for a whole variety of neurological disorders. Okay? But effectively what you're doing is you're trying to listen back through skin, through bone, through dura to neurons. It's like standing outside of a stadium trying to pay attention to any one conversation going on. It's hard to do fundamental physics. You can get closer to the neurons you care about by putting down a patch of, electro of electrodes right on the surface of the brain, okay? Where you uh, are, have contacts that are recording from uh, maybe a few hundreds or thousands of neurons, and you get highly correlated activity, and this is pretty good. But if you can actually put in electrodes that are able to have individual tips come next to individual neurons, then you'll be able to pick up on the conversations of the information content of each and every neuron. And that is 
believe to be the highest information content that there is. Okay? Now you also see that this requires neurosurgery, and this we can all order right on Amazon right now if we wish. Okay? So, you know, welcome to the trade-off in medicine, right? Uh, nobody wants surgery, but if what you're trying to regain in terms of performance is such that it is a safe surgery to put in a small electrode implant, that can be uh, a very viable option. This is four by four millimeters by one millimeter long. So my neurosurgery colleagues sort of go, yeah, it's neurosurgery, but sort of just barely, right? I mean, they're used to going in and debulking tumors right in the middle of the brain. This is just exposing a little bit of the brain and just <laughs> popping in a little sensor right on the tip, okay? It's a very different thing. Okay, so how do we get this sensor in? This uh, video is credit to Jamie Henderson. He loves these types of things. It's, it does convey a whole lot. So here's a sensor that's sitting on the surface of the brain. Imagine that we've created a hole in the skull called a craniotomy, and then we lower that in, okay? And then the tips of the electrodes come to reside, like I said, close to individual cells, such that when one neuron fires, we're able to pick up on an oscilloscope off of each electrode a characteristic action potential. And what we care about is how many action potentials are emitted per second, okay? And that will be a signature of what your intention is. Okay, and I'll explain that more in a second. That is then currently quite uh, unbelievably archaically wired out. Each electrode has one one mil or 25 micron gold wire coming out to a connector. And that connector has the skin brought up around it, but it's penetrating through the skin. It's not wireless to a large preamplifier that then brings our signals here out over to the uh, recording system. So sort of putting it all together, we put in multiple electrode arrays, the tips reside close enough that we can pick up individual action potentials. Okay, so uh, how are we going to now use these signals to control devices? I'm going to introduce you to one task that will uh, be all we need, okay? And it's all sort of variants on that theme. So what we can do is we can train monkeys. Why are we using monkeys? For two reasons. One is we can train them to do elaborate tasks. And second is that their brains are as homologous to human brains as is possible, okay? And still be a viable animal model, okay? And the, uh, you know, as the old saying goes, we don't need yet one more cure for cancer in a mouse. Right? They're well taken care of. Right? The problem is that it very rarely translates to people. Right? So the, the, uh, the extent to which your animal model is appropriate for what you're trying to do in a person really matters if you care about that bridge. Okay? So with monkeys, we train them to look and touch spots of light. We can then, after a few hundred milliseconds, turn on a peripheral target. He says, aha, I'm going to have to reach to that location. So he, would, even without thinking about it, loads in a very quantitative plan that we can read out anytime we want and tell you exactly where he's going to plan to go. He'll wait. We turn these lights off, enlarge this, and that's his go cue to go ahead and reach down. And after some period of time that he just has to wait, I mean, it's as fast as he can move, he actually starts moving his hand out here. It's called the reaction time. So we're just going to have them do this. Animals can do this thousands of times a day. Okay. And what we find is the following. So this is a classic picture from Georgopoulos back in the mid-80s, where when we have the monkey reach out and to the left on one trial, around the time that his arm starts to start, we see an increase in active potentials coming from one neuron. If we have them reach to the left again, we see a pattern like this, third time, fourth time, fifth time. Now compare that to moving his arm to the right for this neuron. Very little activity. And if you look around the clock, you see, aha, this neuron is responding most for leftward movements. And you can plot that out as a function of firing rate of these active potentials as a function of stimulus, and you get a preferred direction. Now, mercifully, one neuron over has 
a completely different preferred direction. The next neuron over may prefer up and to the right. The next one over may prefer down. And so by the time you sample 100 neurons, you're getting great information about all directions you wish to move. And in fact, for any given movement, you're activating most of these neurons. So what we can do is we can learn, after we put an electrode implant in, how each neuron responds for each direction of movement. That's our database, OK? And then we can just take Bayes' rule and flip it around and say, hey, now what's the probability of him moving to the left if I heard the, this neuron fire a lot and very little here, uh, and my next neuron doing something consistent with this pattern and so forth, OK? So this is the whole business of estimation theory. You can use common filters, da, 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 da. OK, lots of wonderful stuff, lots of PhD theses, but fundamentally, that's what's going on. There's no, no magic. OK, so let me just trace quickly through a number of problems just to give you a flavor, right? So this is not a you know, no test, right? Day two and a quarter. So just to give you a flavor of the types of things that are uh, challenges that uh, also tell us where the field is at, OK? And then I'll switch gears to people. All right. So first of all, what we can train our monkeys to do is now not move their hands at all. They can just have their hands down to their side, OK? And on a screen in front of them, they can just think about moving their right arm. We have the electrodes on the left side of the brain about moving the right arm to the right or to the left or up or down, okay? And I'll move this cursor off the screen in front of him. And because there's a green dot here, he knows he has to move it out here, and then he'll get a liquid reward, a little drop of juice, okay? Now, circa 10 years ago, these systems would clearly work, but they wouldn't work all that well. And it turns out that if you just change the so-called decoding algorithm, or the mathematical way in which you interpret all those neural signals to guide that computer cursor, you can do much better than this, OK? So it's not going all that straight. It's not going all that quickly. It's not stopping all that well, and so forth, OK? That'd be like, How many neurons are being recorded from this? Uh, this is about 200 neurons. Yeah. So this would be sort of like, you know, like maybe you're sort of drunk and trying to single finger type, right? You're not quite there, OK? You can do better. So long story short, if you go back to the common filter and you say, well, first of all, I know my monkey's trying to go directly to this location. So after I learn my first filter, anytime I see it not going away, I know better. I know that it should go straight to the target. So I'm going to run some data from this task that I just showed you, then step back into retraining mode. But now saying, hey, those errors that were made were on me. I got the decoding on me. I believe the monkey is always trying to get directly there, OK? And then I can come back and run it again, never cheating when I run it again of saying I know where the target is or something like that, but just having made that one assumption of him knowing where he wants to go. And the second thing is that the way a common filter works is that it propagates uncertainty in both position and velocity, but because this is under direct visual observation, you actually have no positional uncertainty. Your eyes are extremely good at localizing where the target is. So we basically drop the propagation here in the graphical tree. On the right here is now running side by side the new algorithm, where you can see it going pretty straight to the target, stopping, and actually moving more briskly. And in a period of about 20 seconds, what you see is he's able to do about 20 trials instead of about 10 trials, so roughly doubling its speed. Okay? So just by changing out the math, there's huge improvements that you can make. Okay? And this is, uh, you know, well, this is a big improvement. This is the type of stuff that's still going on in the field. It's not like, oh, there is one known positively best way or something like that. EJ? It sort of looks like at the end of those movements, there's a tendency to go around the target instead of dive straight into the middle. Is that for real or am I hallucinating that? No, I think you're right. There's still some slight hook. There's still some slight hook or slight orbit. Uh, more recent methods can get rid of that even and so forth. Yeah, so there's additional few tens of percent here to gain and so forth. And you can also balance this because you can imagine wanting to trade off some of that design space of how briskly it's able to go there even at the expense of some overshoot versus not having that and so forth. Yeah? Do you have to uh, reiterate and have the monkey training with the novel 
with the newest uh, algorithms? Well, you, so, so what if you ran it not the second time, but a third time and a fourth time? You rapidly, after the first one or maybe two reiterations, converge and you don't do better. So it's sort of evidence that you're, you're actually extracting what you can. How many of the neurons are actually needed for this? So if you ask, yeah. which is the, if you take a subset, how many So, so uh, per performance versus number of neuron plots are always some sort of asymptote because it's a fairly simple task. If it were a more complicated task in 3D or 4D or 5D or tons of targets, you wouldn't see an asymptote in the plateau. For this task, by the time you get to roughly 80 to 100 neurons, you're doing probably 95% as well as you will. We're using a couple hundred neurons to be well past that limit. Yeah. The, the, I mean, the, the answer is going to be more neurons is always better for performance, not just as backup neurons in case one neuron is lost. Okay. It's just that in the laboratory setting, sometimes your task can be simple enough that you don't see that benefit unless you think about it more. Okay, second, we need to increase this robustness against neuron threat or dropout. So what we can see is we can look at a moving average in the number of trials that are correct as a function of time and see that things can work, but then it can roll off, but then it can come back. And if I look at the target of one neuron, it might be something similar. So what's going on? Well, while this is, you know, happening all the time. It can happen every half hour or hour, or every couple of days. And you can imagine that your electrodes are not perfectly stable in your brain, which is sort of more like jello than uh, rigid material. And so you can imagine that maybe from recording session one, two, your electrodes are pulling up slightly and thereby changing its recording characteristic. Maybe a neuron is lost. Maybe it returns to the way it used to be. Maybe an electrode breaks. But the point is that your history over days and days and days and days or months and years that you run experiments ought to be relevant. You've seen stuff before. So only if you had a, if you had a way to catalog all that, then any new day start your experiment, you could say, what does this look most similar to or is it de novo? It's like a library that looks like one of the books on my library or do I have to create a new book, okay? So that's sort of the intuitive way I guess of describing what we did, which was to train recurrent neural networks, okay, to take in a truly large amount of data and form a whole set of decoders that are all slightly different and find on the fact that you don't actually see completely de novo recording conditions every day, but they sort of cycle through a few. And when we run that, we see that we can increase our stability. This dark red line shows that the Decode accuracy R squared is going up much more gently when in red we trained using the past 37 days worth of data, okay? Which is you know approaching half a terabyte worth of data. Okay. So third, what about basic neuroscience might help you in designing better algorithms? Okay. So first of all, if we go through this delayed reaching task as I've described it. Uh, here, here, and a twist where we put up a maze, he has to go around visually defined barriers. So here he has to avoid hitting this or it will air up. So he's making movements like this and change it so I can have him move in different ways. And in this way, I can get him to make a whole variety of different directions and curvatures and speed movements. It's like a white voice stimulus, if you want to think of it that way. You you have a huge number of kinematics, okay? That's the type of data you can then ask if we can go ahead and fit a simple linear dynamical system, okay? So, right, so as Steve Boyd is fond of saying, linear dynamic systems have a way of doing unreasonably well, right? Why in the world should a linear dynamic system do this well? Well, you can do better with a non linear dynamic system, but then you have a little hurt on your hands too. So start off with a linear dynamical system. It turns out that we can explain two thirds the data variance by just looking at a skew symmetric matrix that basically says what's happening when you move your arm is you're simply making a nice rotation. Okay, so there seems to be for any movement you wish to make a simple process of just putting your initial condition at the right place along one dimension. Okay, and actually specifically it's along two or three dimensions, 
some subspace, okay? And then at the time of the go, rotate out, but no matter where you start, you're always rotating in the same direction, okay? So this is, this is a shocker to us in the field, and it's very interesting from a neuroscience perspective. And now what we can do is we can uh, just work with David Cecilio and Larry Abbott, extend methods to create so-called late factor analysis via dynamical systems analysis, which basically enables the inference of single trial decoding, okay, using sequential auto decoders. So what I'm showing you here are trial efforts meaning many, many, many reaches to the up and right, looks like this, but now we can decode those on a single trial to do that, okay? So if I take, and this is an example of work, so if I take all of that and say, listen, I just measured this neural system, I believe that it works like a simple dynamical system, I'm going to use that to condition my data such that when I read it out in real time to drive a prosthetic, I'm not fooled by noise, I know that if I see some noise is taking me too far away from a simple rotatory dynamic, it's wrong. So you can merge the two together statistically. Okay? So you can set up graphical, oops, you can set up graphical models where you propagate some hidden state that emits bulk the neural data in blue, as well as the actual position. Okay, you can go ahead and operate it as a common filter. And what you're able to do is the following. The monkey now moving the cursor to hit the color dot on a 6x6 six six or 36 key keyboard and successes have that happy little sound and errors have a lower sad sound. Okay, and so let me point out that this is about four bits per second. If you go through and calculate information rate, okay? Okay, so where does that leave us? Well, it leaves us roughly a few years ago where we felt as though let's take it the final step to really see what we could expect to find in people and if we're convinced we'll take it to people, okay? So what we did was the exact same task that I showed you here. We did not show our monkeys letters. We did not teach them to read. They did not read them. Okay, this is post hoc just to help us visualize that a location corresponds to like a key on a keyboard. Okay, and then what we can do is we can just have them type away. We can do this for hour after hour, day after day after day, and gather statistics. Okay, and we can of course control what the next point he's supposed to hit is, and we generated that from a whole set of New York Times articles or you know cutesy sayings and so forth. And long story short, we we're able to get up well above 10 words per minute or around six bits per second, okay? So we felt as though this meshed well with what people are actually wanting from surveys from our own potential participants so that if they're able to use it, even though it's a safety trial, all we are saying is that we're going to conduct a trial to see if the implant is safe, we'd also secretly like to have them be happy with it too, okay? But we never promise any if efficacy that's that's not appropriate for a phase one safety trial okay so we we're armed with that the second thing we did is we said listen let's try to do at least one thing that you couldn't do with a key uh, with a regular keyboard and that is i wonder if we can actually detect when an error is made from pure neural signals okay now when we hit it wrong we know it somewhere in our brain we know it made an error Right? So, and this is a whole field of reinforcement learning, okay? Where you know if you get a success or a failure. Now, what was surprising to us is when we said, well, let's do the dumbest thing ever. Just look at the arrays that we already have implanted in our monkeys and ask, do we pick out an error signal? So when he moves the cursor over and gets it right, we often would see a success signal. For example, this one neuron's fire right here would go down and stay down. But if you came out over here and you went to the wrong target and you got a failure, you often see this bump in that one neuron. And each neuron, almost every neuron, has a signature like this. And I will not bother you with a whole variety of controls showing that it's nothing other than this. 
this, okay? We said, listen, we can in real time not only decode the kinematics that we want to move the cursor, but also detect when there's error. If we can do that, we can auto-delete keys for you. You don't need to take the time and effort to hit the delete key. It'll just evaporate, okay? That will also increase performance, and people ought to be also very happy about that because they could never do that even if they were able to find it. Okay, I don't know, something, something fun. Okay, so here's how, here's how it normally works. Okay, he hits an error, name of. He has to come hit the delete key and then go back and hit the space, correct the error, and then continue on. That's how it normally works. Now let's turn on the error detect and undo system. Okay. So now he'll be typing along and he'll make an error. We detect that that error happened. Okay, he doesn't see this, this is post-processing. We evaporate the error. And then we move on with him striking the correct key. And when you go through this, this improves the bit rate, this improves the words from it. Okay? Not a given, because if you get too many false positives or misses on that error detect signal, you can hurt your performance, right? So it's not all a given that you would at worst, not do worse, right? You, you could absolutely hurt yourself. This holds up in two monkeys, this holds up in people. Okay, people. So, what we did is we took a clean slate approach to the system that we built for use with our people, uh, built very similar to what we use with our animals, where we'd have millisecond precision control over everything, built on a hard real-time system, okay? And this is sort of not the tradition in the field that comes from life science, uh, but just uh, sort of letting our systems engineering fantasies run wild. From the electrode array, we do some simple band pass filtering and then create two channels, one with the spiking or action potential signals, and the other we would also look at local field potential, okay? where there's some information in that channel as well, which is just sort of an undulation. We'll put it for a common filter and go ahead and use that. So this is a participant uh, who is right in Menlo Park, who is moving a cur computer cursor to hit one of these targets. And what we found is that compared with the previous best, roughly eight seconds to hit these targets, we could drop that down about two and a half. So we'd have about two and a half times performance increase. Okay. So we said, okay, that's good on a simple task, which is just moving out and hitting targets. Just like the monkey, right? Now let's move on to sort of a human-only thing and say, let's let's give you a keyboard, but let's start asking you questions. Okay? So here is uh, our participant T6 sitting in front of a computer screen. The Electra wires are out computers to think back here. And we asked the question: how did you uh, encourage your sons to practice music? She's an avid musician. And she types out the following. This is a, a real, let me turn up the. Sound, okay. So you can see, so this is real time clock. She's able to move the computer cursor over and select keys. Now this is the left side implant, so she's imagining moving her right arm, left, right, up or down to control the location of the cursor. And then she's imagined squeezing her ipsilateral fist as a click signal, okay? And that's why when the cursor moves over here, you can get a click right away, you don't have to like wait there as well or something like that. Okay, this is pretty good. This is 24 characters per minute. And this is, you know, she read the, she read the sentence, but now she has to think about what she wants to say and type it. Okay, well, there's still this thinking about what you want to say that can be time consuming. And that's why we all never took typing tests that had us think about anything. We said, listen, here's a sheet of paper, copy, right? That, if you want to measure that, then we can move into a copy typing task where we say, when the sunlight strikes raindrops in the air, just please copy that. And we do that. Okay, and we can reach about 32 correct characters per minute or about eight words per minute. Okay, which is by a factor of about two or three better performance uh, than, than other systems in the world. Okay, now you'll also notice that this is a weird keyboard, right? 
We don't use this keyboard. This is called an app keyboard, right? Welcome to human computer interface design, right? Whole area of a computer science building devoted to this. And the point simply is that you're transporting a cursor. You want to keep close together because movement time costs time. You want to keep close together in the center, the more commonly used letters, and get the Z and the X, the Q key out there. Actually sprinkle in a couple of delete keys to optimize and so forth. So that's part of why she's doing better. Is, is that all we're doing? And it's a sort of a sucky system, but we can use a good keyboard. No. So I'll show you this. So not only in the participant I've been showing you across five days, but another participant for a couple of days, the results are black. So indeed, they're better because we you know, use the right keyboard. But it's quite comparable to if you use the standard QWERTY keyboard as shown here. So it's not some huge difference. It's not just due to that. OK. So as a final thing, we said, listen, what, what we keep hearing from participants and there's a couple of participants here. There's a couple on the East Coast. You know, there's a multi-site clinical trial, so we can generalize our findings a little quicker. Is that they basically just want to use a tablet, right? They just they, like enough already with custom keyboard that just you know ultimate control over everything. Just give me okay. So we ordered from Amazon, right? A Nexus 9 tablet running Android, okay? Chrome browser. And now, for the very first time, we allow work completion and prediction. That's just naturally built into the keyboard. They can use that if they want. Before they could, we want real information. Okay? And uh, just, you know, have at it. Okay? So the tablet's over here, just rendering it here so you can see it. Again, she's uh, not only an avid physician, but also an avid gardener. She likes to look at orchids. So she types in orchid and then uses word completion. She searches clicks, and note we did not turn this on accessibility. This text is not made extra large. It's totally small, in fact, and that's because we wanted to uh, push on the precision with which she's able to control that cursor. Like you or me, she gets a page of text and says, yeah, forget this, I just want some pretty pictures, right? Goes back, goes to image search in Google, I mean, it's very, like, this is exactly the type of thing we do, right? And see some orchids. And there you go. Okay, so multiple people running tons of different apps. I'll just show you one more, just, just so I've you two things. Okay, uh, do you want to play a song? So on the tablet, she pulls up a keyboard. Okay. It's not great, you can certainly tell the melody. Okay? She was very happy with this. And so, you know, just imagine countless hours, multiple participants. Uh, you know, I won't show you because I view it as a little gimmicky, but you know, one time a participant on the East Coast and West Coast were both using it at the same time. They actually were able to G chat from each other using their interfaces and stuff. So you can imagine the stuff that people have actual fun with. And that is important to us always, right? They devote their lives to helping us advance medical systems for the broader public that may never serve them. Let's let them have some fun, okay? All right, so in the remaining, I have 10 minutes left, so let me take five minutes of that to just blast through some future directions, and then we'll take questions, does that sound? Okay, so first, how are we gonna record for many more electrodes and wirelessly transmit this data to a little power? So we've been working on a very standard looking system that's now ready to go into people uh, early next year. And that is to go ahead and put electronics in a welded titanium cam, the absolute standard in the field, wired to two of these electrodes that we're used to, and have a sapphire port so you can get the RF signals through this. Okay, this is the brainchild of Arda and Rico and the Hochberg out of Brown and MDH. Okay, that's good, but that's sort of existing technology. Now, if we think about the recording systems that are on the horizon, they're not, you know, these that have been used. So things like Dick's company, Paradromics, putting in bundles of 10,000 electrodes, 
or these so-called neuropixels that many of you are familiar with. Many, I know many of you are using them in the audience, uh, where you can record from uh, 384 out of 1,000 channels simultaneously. It's all multiplexed to just a few wires. It's really revolutionizing things. And uh, what we've done is that we've adapted these rodent versions for use in monkeys and stuff the design specs with Hughes and iMac to fabricate these things. So these are coming off the line now. So in monkeys, we're now able to record from super high density electrodes. We're able to see an action potential show up on multiple channels. If I blow up here, you can see this. This is an unbelievable ability to spike to it with super high quality. So we're getting tens of views of the same neuron. We can tell them apart. And for the very first time, we can penetrate these through motor cortex and say, through the thickness of the cortex, nearby neurons can have very different tuning directions. Tuning directions given by the color here, so you notice that there's just this complete potpourri of colors showing here, okay? So, one thing we can do to contend with this onslaught of channel count, right? So the point is, you're gonna have so many more channels, how are you gonna broadcast all of that out, okay? So, you know, never ever bet against scaling CMOS, right? Power goes down, great, okay? But the second thing to do is the more we know about the features we want, the features we need, we can extract those features and basically do data compression up front and not have to transmit it through the radio, which is where you incur a lot of costs, okay? You can keep it off your ADC and keep it off your radio channel. So one thing that I have not brought out until now is that for all the movies with people and monkeys that I've showed you, we've not, we have not spiked sweat. We've simply taken the raw recording, we've leveled it, meaning high cast it, the action potentials of these spikes like this, we just put down a threshold, so we take when potentially two different neurons, in fact, we sort it, we know there's two different neurons, and just count all the spikes coming from those two neurons, even though two nearby neurons in motor cortex would seem like the worst idea ever, because those two neurons can have randomly oriented tuning directions, okay? This is a piece of work we did with Surya Ganguly in physics here, where if you go through random matrix projection theory, you find that unless every pair of neurons is conspiring against you to point in opposite directions, you don't wash out all your signal, you on average get a new net result because you're just lumping together two neurons. There's a lot of similarities that I don't have time to go into in terms of what principal components analysis does because this is just linearly summing neurons, so too is this process. Long story short is, Laying on a threshold and then just transmitting the time those spikes are sent is dirt easy and low power compared to 30 kilo samples sampling, you know, 8 to 10 to 12 bit depth, and dot, dot, dot. Okay, so let me be very clear on the message here. For many applications, you have to spike sort. For the retina, you have to spike sort. There's critical reasons for spike sorting, critical reasons for transmitting that stuff in many applications. But, for motor prostheses, the field has been finding for the last 15 years that you give up only a 2 or 3% performance by not spike sorting. We'd much rather have 10,000 channels without spike sorting than even 1,000 channels with spike sorting. It's a unique to motor prosthetics thing, okay? As we go to different areas of the brain, it could change around. All right, I uh, won't we'll belabor it, but for basic science, this is good too. Now, second, how robust is BMI decoding the spike error rate? So I just convinced you, I'm just going to send when one electrode encounters one action potential. And I don't even care which action potential it came from. Now I'm going to make it even an easier problem by saying, I don't even care if you always send me that spike. You lose some, you get some up, okay? And why is that? Well, a neuron is fundamentally pretty darn noisy. The Poisson process, it itself is not that reliable. So surely I should not expect to do, and you see this all the time in circuit neurons, because you come from a telecommunications perspective where you have that bit error rate that's in the minus nine or 10 or 11 or something, and you say, that's what I need for transmitting neurons. No, okay? Yeah, that's what you need to transmit an internet, an internet protocol with error correct and so forth. But for neural data, what we can do is we can play a simple game here. We did this in simulation, okay? This is joint work with Boris Merman. 
is that we have the, electric, uh, the times in one millisecond bins of when action potentials went down. We can use that raw neural data to make an estimate, as shown in black here, of, for example, the cursor velocity in the horizontal dimension. And we can calculate an error between our estimated and the real, and we get some R squared value. Okay? Now, what I can do is I can distort the signal. This is my simulation. I can flip a coin, and I can change how often I change the information in each slot. For example, here I'm simulating a 1%, a 10 to the minus 2 error. Okay? Now, of course, what that's going to result in is some worse ability to decode, and I'm going to get some lower R squared on the spike error. And then what I can say is I wonder how that degraded signals R squared compared to the original signals R squared as I go from low distortion, 10 to the minus 6, up through the distortion I'm showing you into a super high distortion of like 10% or even more. And across both monkeys and a person, we see that by you can go all the way out to about a 0.1% error rate in your spikes. Okay? So take 0.1% of your spikes and I don't care. Throw them away, make 0.1% up, do some combination of the two. It doesn't affect my decoder performance. I'm not saying it doesn't matter to the brain. I'm saying that when you're pulling it out as an engineer and trying to use it, for my application, I can't tell the difference either. Okay? So that together sets some new low power circuit design opportunities based on using threshold crossings and fairly high SMRs. EJ. That 0.1% seems very low in, uh, in relation to the explanation about Poisson firing and so on. Like if you use whatever, 10 millisecond time bins or something and you do a Poisson process, it's actually going to be even higher than that. Do you, is, is this really connected to the Poisson style firing or is it something else? Uh, I, th I think it's connected. I think it's. I can't put it on the fly. A single neuron process, what you get across a whole population, and also making through the bin width. But I think it's in the right range. I think that that is the fundamental connection. Okay. So, what I'm going to do for sake of time is just summarize number two and then we'll stop. And summarizing number two is that what we're also able to do now is go look at speech production in our people, which is a human-only thing. And we can do so because we can put in electrode arrays in areas of the brain where we normally are. We can ask people to be silent or utter different phonies or syllables. And we can find that individual neurons have very different response patterns across the arrays. So we're able to, for the very first time, look at single neuron resolution populations of spoken words. Okay? And this uh, is very similar to what Eddie Chang, our friend and colleague at the UCSF, and collaborator, is doing with ECOG grids, but that doesn't look at single neurons. It's able to look at single neurons. And so by bringing that together, we might be able to start by creating high performance. Uh, speech prostheses. Okay? So with that, <coughs> with apologies to trim the talk and not continue on for the final slides, other than to show the very most important slide is to take questions, which is acknowledge wonderful students and postdocs, both present and past, on the clinical trial side, special recognition of Jamie Henderson, my partner in crime and everything, the students and postdocs, the staff, the clinical trial participants, and funny cases. Thank you.
quicker and stuff better at higher rest times. I don't know the, the exact functional form of that scaling. I have two questions. One is, uh, how do you decide where is the initial implant? Uh, it has to be somewhere on the motor cortex primary, I suppose. But uh, how specific um, can you be about that? And can you address that uh, yeah. for the better of particular subjects? Uh, the second question is, uh, how does the, the patients themselves or subjects themselves actually adapting actively? To yeah. the, to the That's a good question. So first question is, how do we know where to put the electrode away? The simple answer is that if it's well-targeted areas that we've done in the past, you can just basically look at the anatomy uh, as you're doing the operation, uh, but typically preceded with a structural MRI just to make sure you know where the vessels are, if it really is the particular you know, pre-central gyrus loop that you're looking at and so forth. Now, second, to become even more patient-specific, which is especially important as you branch out into other areas of the brain of the human, which is really surprisingly part of territory, then functional magnetic resonance imaging, where you, in the days ahead of the surgery, ask people to go through various tasks, imagine moving your arm, imagine doing these things, see what areas you're laying right up. Uh, then intraoperatively, you can target those areas if you wish. Your second question sorry, is uh, the, uh, does the subject actually adapt? Adapt, to yeah. So, uh, yes and no. Okay. The systems that we try to build are so called biokinetic, meaning that we can ask them to do very understandable things right away, like try to move your right arm to the right or left or up or down. Okay. And that, in that situation, uh, we get the performance to work pretty well, and it works pretty close to as good as it'll work, and then maybe there's a few percent that'll improve after the initial day or two, okay? The other answer is that we can definitely, okay, and this is work by folks like Carmena, friend and colleague at Berkeley, if we went and intentionally built a worse decoder for the purpose of giving the person more pressure on them to improve more, then they can engage brain plasticity and adaptation to work through the decoder that's not ideal to begin with and to get it to work better. It'd be like giving you a, an, an unorthodox tool, like a hammer with an offset. Like you'll, you'll learn to use it over time. We, we're trying to get people with a, like a regular hammer. Okay? So it, definitely brain learning and adaptation is there. We're not directly highlighting that here or, or, or coupling into it. Great talk as always. Uh, I was curious um, why you use u arrays as opposed to ECOGS, because as you mentioned with Eddie Chang's, they're able to decode like 14 degree of freedom movements with ECOGS for speech synthesis. Mm -hmm. And so like, surely if they could do that, like we could probably achieve similar performances for two degrees with ECOGS for cursor control as well, which yeah. would then be less invasive. Yeah, so I think that it is, uh, an open question exactly how ECOG versus penetrating electrodes do, where you're making different trade offs. Uh, for speech, for example, it could be important to have large areas of the brain covered, and ECOG can do that so readily because you get to lay on the surface. Okay. I mean, just to be clear, I'm technology agnostic. I will happily use whatever technology is there, okay? So I have no horse in the fight, okay? Uh, horse in the fight. Dog fight. Okay, so I'm not fighting for a record Okay. Um, uh, second, though, fundamentally, uh, you tend to, with any one particular region of a cortex, be able to get more information out the more actual neurons you latch onto. Again, this analogy of listening to the individual cells' activity that conveys that information. The dream sensor would give you both broad areas of coverage, high density in certain locations, three-dimensional sampling, and so forth. So I think that it's possible that you want to have for a system that does arm movement control and speech, for example, some of both. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
So uh, how complicated is this pipe squirting algorithm? Is it possible to do it on chip level? Yes. Oh, so, so you are on, on chip? We did not, but it can be done. It can be done, okay. Yeah. Uh, and, and the second question is, how uh, you show the graph but, basically. But nothing oh. is without cause, right? Oh, okay. So, okay. so well, put it this way. Tell me something that can't be done on a chip. Most things can be done on a chip. <laughs> <laughs> the real question is, will it be robust to the changing recording? Will it be low enough power? Will it scale well? All these types of subtle things make it that if you don't need to spike sort, just like if you don't need to do anything, then uh, oh, you don't want to do that. that. That's all. But people are absolutely making spike sorting chips. You know, 15 years ago, Teresa Ming and Double B and I, you know, we, we said, yep, this is how you do it. Okay, you can actually make spike sorting chips. This is going on at Stanford and the community and everything. Neuralink, making in-house spike sorting chips, right? There's no doubt that you'll always build it slightly better because if you're able to spike sort perfectly, you could always choose to lump the signals back together. But I would say if you're able to spike sort separately, you will do better. But in our application, you'll probably do better on the order of 1 to 5%. That's all. Yes? Yeah. Just a couple more questions here. Go ahead. Uh, uh, from the perspective of physicists, I'm surprised how disorganized the brain seems to tune around <laughs> so close together to be so different. Is there understanding about that? And the second thing is, um, is that uh, disorganized or well? It seems disorganized to me, but I, maybe maybe you understand the organization, or we will understand the organization. But, uh, it, is it understood? And the second thing is, is it, despite, or maybe it's just technological challenges, but wouldn't it be better to to, to get information from the brain stem where, where things are denser? And can you speak to that? Yeah. So to the first question, certainly. The fact that you and Hazel first recorded it with V1 uh, is a strong belief that many other areas of the brain would look like that. By that, I mean cortical columns, nearby neurons, all the way through the thickness, would all be tuned to a certain direction of visual motion or orientation of a bar. And that there's probably constraint, like keeping wiring short the other, you know, among light type neurons and so forth. So I think that there's a whole uh, set of thinking. Maybe some of it's lower, maybe some of it's real. I would say that maybe it's not really all that known in V1, okay? Uh, and I'm sitting right next to an expert in V1 and mouse, where it's very interesting how you can spatial temporally write in information. You can start getting at these questions, okay? Uh, <clears throat> phenomenal paper, Marshall et al. Science, see it. It's, it's a field changer, okay? In motor cortex, the fact that you find nearby neurons that do different things, I mean, it doesn't bother me, but I don't think I have any insight as to why it is that way. It just is that way. Uh, I don't know what the constraint would be that would force it not to be. Sorry, the second question. Um, is, it, is it beneficial? Brain stem. Brain stem. Well, so, okay, so brain stem, you have to be careful because it's very easy to kill people. Okay, so the more ancient, lower, more compressed areas of the brain, two things happen. One is, is that so many of your functions are so much closer together, you have to be very careful. You don't get accidentally into a breathing area, this type of thing. Second is, is that there's something nice about the cortex that it's all splayed out. So it actually gives you pretty big areas to hit. Okay. Uh, I think those, you know, Daniel and AJ and others that think about the visual representations, there's different advantages of working at the retina or the LGN or the V1 and so forth, or even higher visual areas. And there's always this trade off. Um, but it's possible to think about putting. Uh, uh, electrodes, read, write it, any one of these stages, just thinking through carefully what those trade offs are, those approaches would be. Okay, last question. Um, coming back to the spike sorting question, which is kind of a deep one, because as you mentioned, let's say in the retina, if you want to encode information very well, you need to figure out the different cell types to do that. And the question is why the situation is different here, even though. It's the same as the retina in the sense that there are two nearby cells that code totally different things in the natural system. And one could argue that it may have to do with the simplicity and restricted nature of the task. Yeah, so that could. The only thing you're doing with this motor cortex in this human is navigating around a, you know, a particular grid and so on. Whereas if potentially if you opened up the set of behaviors to a much richer set of behaviors, just like we try to do with vision, encode a rich set of images, you might need 
to separate out those neighboring cells and cope different directions and do the right stuff. Do you think that's possible? I, I think it's fully possible. I mean, the, I'll tell you the insights. Ten years ago, we wanted to have really moving monkeys recording from the virus and using computer vision to track their every movement as the most natural flowing motor effort there is, which is quite different than anything you can do with a monkey sitting in a chair. Okay. We haven't run these exact analysis on those data, and of course, 10 years ago, it's very different than today, where so much of the machine learning technologies come along, but you can do it more. People like Paul Nagyukian here at Stanford are coming back to that same problem. We'll know that answer in these more rich tasks soon. All I can say is that up to and including tasks that are moving the arm in every sort of imaginable way you can imagine an arm moving. This is what we're seeing. So I will never say that it won't be better to spike swing. I absolutely agree. It's just that somebody said, uh, you know, how much money should I spend on spike sorting? Should I devote my PhD thesis to this problem and spike sorting for this problem? I would have to say, make up your own mind. But here's some data, okay? I think it's radically happening to know your program. It's radically different than the retina, to be sure. It's, it's, it's quite half no cell types and so forth. So I think it could just be specific to the domain, or it could be because the task is so limited. It, it, it is true that we're finding that spike sorting, I mean, it, it, I mean, Daniel can probably speak to this more. You know, to me, perhaps the most interesting problem is that when we're thinking about multi dimensional tasks, and the dimensionality of the neural data that we're recording, and the dimensionality of the actual neural system, and trying to keep those all straight, it turns out to be a really interesting problem. Whereas if we fundamentally believe that we have a low-ish dimensional system, called, let's say the motor cortex, to the best of our estimates, again, maybe it's definitely task limited, time limited, there's, there's formal treatments that Surya has worked up on these things, but let's call motors 10 to 15 dimensional, okay? And then you come in and you record from hundreds and hundreds of neurons. You're, you're oversampling that enough that it may not matter if you're starting to basically combine measurements between two different neurons. If I take a thousand neurons and I say, well, I'll give you access to them pairwise, well, I still be able to reconstruct that 10D to 15D space as accurately as if I had access to every one of those thousand neurons. And the answer keeps coming up seeming like, yeah, but at some point you oversample it in that sense, you learn the fundamental neural dynamical system, and then from that you can go decode whatever you wish. So there's some something like that that's going on in the motor system, it seems. For writing information into the retinal, uh, visual pathway, and also the visual pathway, presumably the dimensionality is dramatically higher uh, in terms of at least what the dimensionality of scene, natural scene statistics would be. Uh, I can just imagine being at just very different orders of magnitude. If you, to, if you want to scale yeah. up to playing the piano, yeah. that's pretty high dimensional. It actually is controlling things that are like fingers. It, like, it is, but it's not, still not vision. By any, no. You know, we're close to vision. It's still... <laughs> no, I'm not making fun of that. I'm just saying that it's still, you know, if I, I can conduct a symphony with an arm, that's pretty high. I mean, I have roughly 30 D on an arm. So if I hold my hands like this and I move all five fingers like this, you know, maybe the dimensionality is about the same. And if I do it twice, it's about the same. But it's still, still I'm still playing sub 100 D. And I don't know, is there a good estimate for vision? Above thousands, right? And I can just call it thousands. Thousands, I think, right? I mean, look at look at image, look at this image right here. This is this is not a hundred D image, presumably. I don't know. These are fascinating open neuroscience and math questions. I think that have us all so interested in. Okay, on this note, let's thank you.